right? Like I think our, our, our work businesses and HR teams and teams in general, culture is mattering. And so I think we've, we've made a lot of progress since my early career where it was, I think there was a lot more outward contention in work where people had specific agendas where they were willing to do that. I find myself in a much more collaborative world in the past decade, I think, than, than early in my career. Hi, I'm Tracy Lovejoy. And I'm Shannon Lucas. We are the co-CEOs of Catalyst Constellations, which is dedicated to empowering Catalyst to create bold, powerful change in the world. This is our podcast, Move, Move Fast, Break, break Shit, shit Burn Out, where we speak with Catalyst executives about ways to successfully lead transformation in large organizations. And today I'm excited to have my good friend with us, Sharon Key. Welcome, Sharon. Thanks so much for having me. As Senior Vice President of Sales and Partnerships at Feedonomics, Sharon is responsible for building a robust partner network and helping enterprise merchants all over the world grow their business. She's led sales teams and business development teams in the commerce technology and systems integration space for multiple global companies such as Big Commerce, Scubana, Born, Fluid, acquired by Astown, and Tribal. Sharon grew up in Colorado and received her bachelor's, she double majored in music and business, and master's degree in music, vocal performance from Colorado State University and the University of Northern Colorado, respectively. During and after college, she spent her early career touring as a spinto soprano, if I said that right, in the US, Europe, and Asia with various companies. As if she has free time, but in her free time, because she's a ball of energy, Sharon loves spending time with her two kids, William and Dahlia, on the flower farm in Boulder, just down the road from me. She also loves good coffee. Stay tuned. She's opening an amazing coffee shop in Longmont, uh, Manhattan. She lived there for 10 plus years, the Colorado mountains and winning deals, board games, you name it, and helping others actualize. So fun to have you here. Yeah, it's, I, I'm an excellent company, I know. <laughs> All right, well, let's start off. I mean, you and I saw the sparks immediately when we got to hang out. I'd love to understand sort of in your own words, how you relate to the concept of catalyst and what does maybe being a catalyst signify for you in your leadership role? I think there's lots of different sizes of companies, um, but one thing that is a through line that you see in a lot of a lot of them is this kind of fire in the belly that people have to make a change. Um, it looks different in small companies where they're out in, you know, in the vanguard, in the front leading, articulating a new value proposition to the market or making waves or bringing their, their network into a small fledgling business that they want to have grow. Um, you see that in startups. You see it um, in agency business development when you're out there hunting, right, um, building relationships. You know, people have to trust you. Um, I think you also see it in public companies, but it's harder to spot because it looks more like an entrepreneur than an entrepreneur. They're the ones who are constantly like passionately saying, yeah, but why are we doing it that way? Are, are you, we, shouldn't we, should we look over here and see if we should look at it over, like maybe trying to do it a little bit differently? So I think that um, that challenger mindset, depending on the size of the company, changes around whether it's a challenge external or whether it's a challenge internal. Um, and I, you know, after talking to you, you put a great uh, language to it, which I think you call it a catalyst. And that's, that's really fun because I think we've all seen those people. Uh, and when you, when you find them, you go, ah, somebody who gets it, somebody who's willing to like contend for the thing that we want, that we all see that we should go get, uh, that it's up to us to go get. 100%. And I just I have a follow up question on that, because um, I know a little bit about your story, obviously, and how you were able to see a market opportunity, bring that to your company, convince them that it was the right direction, and then essentially kind of been handed largely the reins for that. How was that process for you as a catalyst? Yeah, I think, you know, when you're you're speaking about um, at Big Commerce, we saw the opportunity to where omnichannel commerce requires really good quality product data. And so um, you know, have amazing partners on on the big commerce side where we said, hey, what if if we acquired the market leader in product feed management that powers 30% of the internet retailer 1000 feeds? What could that do for us? What, what, what if that was true? What would it mean for our business? How could we help our customers grow? And that what if this what would it take for this to be true? Um, you start and the entire sea of people in front of you is a red team. And every person you talk to, you have to flip them to blue. And so what that look, what you say, what does that look like? What does it look like being a catalyst, helping a company see the opportunity around why acquiring a company might be a good idea? It's, um, it is a giant campaign to help people see your perspective 
and the opportunity in front of them with business case after business case. And you have to turn business stakeholders and marketing stakeholders and technology stakeholders. And a lot of political agendas kind of have to align in order for you to see the larger opportunity there. And I think number one, you have to have trusting, amazing partners on the other side who work with you to help build that. So I couldn't be more impressed with the product strategy of, you know, Brent Bellum and the leader and Russ Klein and Brian Dot and the leadership at Big Commerce because doing, you know, making bets that that put you in a leadership position is hard because you have to do it two years before that anyone else thinks you're ready. <laughs> and so luckily that's worked out pretty well with uh Feedonomics as as now part of the Big Commerce family. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, it's a it's such an amazing team. I mean it it makes it easier when the when the group of people that you're looking looking at are are as quality as the Feedonomics founders and and uh, team that they built. What an amazing organization. So now we just have to have to make sure we do right by the customers and and unlock that potential that all of us have seen. That sounds special. It sounds amazing for you as a leader to have been able to step in and help maintain such what was already such a positive culture. That's great. It's just a privilege. There's, there's nothing else there, right? It's about making sure that you're doing right by by all the people who believed in it. That's fantastic. Not always not always true in an acquisition, right? So <laughs> yeah, I think that's more the exception than the rule. That's true. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> So you've spent a lot of time driving transformation in organizations and would love to have you share with us from the catalyst lens, not just the, the entrepreneur, but from the catalyst executive lens, what are one or two major challenges that you've experienced when trying to drive transformation within an organization? I think laying bare the, the real situation, whatever the situation is, whether it's political or whether it's the mar what's happening in the market that you need to address, or whether it's personalities or people or or the theory of incentives at play you know when when companies get bigger they tend to silo so that they don't so that they don't slow down right because if if it requires all of the people in a company to make a decision you move too slow and so creating functional teams that are that have decision making power in and of themselves is not necessarily a bad thing right you see that with companies like amazon who've done a lot of work to try and make it possible for you know even if they have duplicative roles in some cases they will they will end up having uh teams that that from soup to nuts from the beginning in the, of an initiative all the way through the the go to market and the launch and the maintenance and the support and the pr and the marketing they will group all of those into one group specifically so that they don't slow down because inertia is a killer right it um we have to make sure that that we can do that so from a catalyst lens one of the biggest challenges and opportunities, I think, is understanding where that machine that you are in is serving you and where you might need to question and break down where the pieces exist or float on top of it, right? So you might have this team has a, has its own catalyst and goals and direction and, and move, you know, it's it's moving and, and momentum is going in a certain direction. And some instead of trying to figure out how to say, no, don't do that, it's anti, you know, it's it's counter to what we think we should be doing. You have to figure out how to kind of jet stream in together where you're, 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 um, you need to figure out how to put the walls on the river. So the river still works with you instead of trying to dam the river because it will always overwhelm you, you know? So I think that's the biggest challenge is one, how do you build trust with the other catalysts who, whose agendas might be competing with yours and that might be necessary for the success of the larger company. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the biggest ones. And then two, so one, build trust to identify that beautiful Venn diagram where what you want is what they want and then focus there, get really narrow around how you can do that together. And that's kind of the partnerships thing. Mm -hmm. Like I've said that over and over, there's not a thing a salesperson sells that a partnership person didn't tell them to, right? And so making sure that you can align what the initiatives are, where, where you can get the go-to-market, where one plus one equals three on the go-to-market, I think is one of the other biggest opportunities and challenges that catalysts have. I love that. And, and going back, I know you named it one trust and in, in two Venn diagram, but you also started with something that really caught my interest of laying bare the real challenges. Yeah. And we've just done a piece of research with our Catalyst Leadership Trust. So I don't know if you've heard about the, the group of executives we bring together, looking at what is it that makes their superpowers shine? Like what is it that helps Catalyst get to that executive level? And one of the things we see is that systems thinking which is what I hear when you say really laying bare the real challenges, right? Whether it's political or relationship or whatever the case may be. And so it sounds like you're able to come into your role and really look at what's truly happening here. Where's power? How are decisions made? You know, who are the, the folks that are happening? And then within that decide the trust building, the Venn diagram, which is super powerful. Yeah, I, I like where you're going with that. I think one of the other pieces is, 
it's so easy to, to, to pit yourself against a thing because as humans, we want to solve problems. And I think what's really interesting is sometimes the problem is actually the inertia. It is the structure in which you exist. And, and it's a motivating enough people to say, let us, what if we existed in a different way? Because yeah. it's usually never, I, I never had the experience where people are trying to, trying to prevent you from doing a thing usually, right? Like I think our, our, our work businesses and HR teams and teams in general culture is mattering. And so I think we've, we've made a lot of progress since my early career where it was, I think there was a lot more outward contention in work where people had specific agendas where they were willing to do that. I find myself in a much more collaborative world in the past decade, I think, than, than early in my career. And so the challenges we are, but that sometimes makes the challenges harder because they're lurky. They're mm -hmm. tricky things that are actually hard problems that multiple smart brains, introverts, extroverts, engineers, go-to-market leaders, analysts, strategists need to come together to be able to kind of lay bare what is the actual challenge here. Um, and so I, I like what you're saying there, but I often think sometimes the challenge is how can we redeploy these, these existing resources that we have without spending more? How do we get more out of it? How do we become more efficient? And mm -hmm. particularly in the market we're in now, there's a lot of challenging ourselves that are require that. And so some of it is like challenging our concepts of what people are good at. It's mm -hmm. sometimes it's, hey, maybe that person doesn't have an engineering background, but they're a really spectacular sales engineer because they understand the, the technical concepts, but they know how to relate to people really well. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's about challenging your concept of what people are capable of. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, oh, maybe that person who's on that product team would actually be really good in the go-to-market team because they could infuse some empathy into this org that has historically only lived in that team. So those are some of the ideas that come to mind when we think about how to how do catalysts identify their their areas of opportunity and challenge and then break through or redirect the walls to to their benefit. I, I love that and totally agree. And to me, this is, you know, you mentioned earlier that catalysts can sometimes be harder to see in the organizational context that they'll be seen as entrepreneurs. And this to me is where we can see kind of a divide between how people talk about entrepreneurs and then what we talk about with catalysts. Because you're mm -hmm. saying like, yes, there's business opportunities that I've identified and we're going to create shared value. And sometimes what we need to do is go past looking at just the business opportunity and be looking at the system, um, which is super interesting. If, if I hand you a magic wand, Sharon, so right here through the screen, boom, considering these challenges, and you've laid out several, right? Like being able to make bare what the challenges are, building the trust, finding that overlapping Venn diagram, being able to redeploy in creative ways, what type of support or resources do you feel would best enable when you were in these moments of challenge? I think... Um... One of the things that you guys do so well and that we we definitely value on our side is, you know, we have leadership coaches that our leaders work with who are external. They, you know, it's like having a work therapist, which is the best thing in the world because you get two <laughs> smart brains helping you work through these problems that make you feel seen while also allowing you to kind of get a 30,000 foot view of what you're doing. And then I and understand your strengths and skills and then come to the table with new ideas that aren't necessarily in the in the thick of it, you know what I mean? They're, they So I think you guys offer this amazing opportunity for people to identify how they can help in an effective way, you mm -hmm. know, where you have that voice of reason saying, I hear you want that, but like, are you actually adding value to the company? Like you have to make sure that we're meeting the goals of the organization before we go meet your catalyst objectives, whatever you think that, you know, whatever you've defined them to be. So, um, you know, I think uh, leadership coaching is some is a cultural thing that a lot of companies haven't yet kind of moved towards yet. And I think it's one of the biggest benefits that that we have because continuing to invest in our people when they're doing new things you know people rise in companies because you, they know the company oftentimes they you know and and we we are so upset when we feel like we have to bring in someone externally in order to be able to like meet that challenge because they've done it before and i yeah. think that that just means we're not doing enough work to figure out how to help our help our internal folks who have amazing understanding of the problem space and of the people and of the you know, of the, let's call it the board game layup, we, we have to just give them examples of different strategies, right? So the magic wand, what would you do? I think I would like try and matrix learn Kung Fu, all of the leadership coaching wisdom that comes along with being a executive for 35 years. The best way to do that is to try and pipe it into the brains of our already existing in-seat leaders, because it's definitely the most efficient way to help them grow to help the culture grow and realize that you can grow within the organization you're in and then also deliver value for the company. 
I think you're also pushing what sometimes we talk about when we think about executive coaching, which I love because executive coaching is, is at its foundation, like a set of goals and how I want to develop as a leader and someone who supports that. You're also talking about having a thought partner yep. that is really there with you as you move through these elements. And I know when I first started in coaching and I was figuring out who I was, it, which actually led me to thinking about catalysts is people would say to me, I've never worked with someone who could keep up with me. And I think that's a struggle for Catalyst executives is to find folks that can be right there with them. Uh, no, no disrespect. It's just that we have a brain that works in that way and work jumps laterally and moves quickly and builds connections. So that's, that's just really well, interesting. And I think has, has, a, has a similar share, some, some kind of shared experience. Like it is a unique yeah. for all of the ups and downs and understanding how the resistance, the antibodies might attack you uh, is different than a lot of other business problem solving things. Sort of yeah, building. I, yeah, go ahead. No, please. You go. More thoughts. I, I, I love that what um, coaching does is it helps us be the best versions of ourselves and then learn how to bring those, whether it's to work or to like, we're all here to be better humans, right? Like we're all just humans working jobs because that's what we need to do. And, and we're hopefully, you know, making products and services that make the world a better place. But at the same time, it's, it's, we're, we're not necessarily, we're kind of far afield from it. It doesn't feel like an everyday life necessarily you can literally see your direct impact on humanity and but i think that when you like kind of like being a mother like you know if you can be the best mom to your kids that you possibly can you know that you're doing your part for the world i think if you can be well, you know i used to think force of nature is what i wanted to be and now mother nature is what i want to be right i want to create a space i want to create the resources and the the you know like if your gale wins all the time you're not going to, you're not going to be able to, to do what is necessary, but if you can bring the sunshine and enough rain and, and the situation where, where people feel like they can grow, it, people want to grow, plants want to grow. Like, you know, the farmer in me comes out a little bit, but I think realizing that sometimes fast is not efficient and sometimes force of nature isn't, doesn't create the growing environment that mother nature does is one of the challenges that catalysts have because they, they see through Ooh, if we only did this, and I think it's really easy to become contentious about that, or to be a, the 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 bull in the china shop, or to be, you know. And I think, you know, I have had to learn. That's one of my biggest challenges my whole life is slow down, bring people along, help them understand, tell your story, tell the story, right? If the story is my customer can't do this, and if we were able to, what needed to be true for my customer to be able to have a better experience here, or my partner to be able to have a better experience here? That um, thoughtfulness around creating the space that allows other people to then grow with you, I think is really critical in terms of how can we accelerate transformation? Sometimes you got to slow down to speed up. Okay. I fucking love that so much. And I was going to ask you, actually, I was going to say, I want to go off script, Sharon, because even before you gave us that freaking phenomenal mic drop thing. I wanted to ask you, so one of the things that I love about you that I think makes you unstoppable that frankly, I'm, I learn from you so often when we talk is you can walk that line, like almost nobody else, like your energy is off the, just, to, just so you know, like what Sharon and I went away on the weekend and like, she's up at eight every on the weekend. Like she's got so much energy. I'm like, oh, I feel bad. She's full of energy. I can see the force of nature thing. The other side of catalyst can be that we can show up. We have this the, the the dichotomy of the get shit done, make the world better, move faster. But a lot of times we also have empathy. And it's like, and we can have empathy for people who can't move as fast as we can, or maybe like they're not in the right role. And we're just like with a little bit more coaching or whatever. That's a tough line to walk. And I love the mother nature analogy. And I'm wondering if you can just describe, like double click on that a little bit. You're like, I watch you make these business choices that are <clears throat> bottom line compassion for the person and also the right thing for the business. And the bottom line compassion doesn't mean it's always a great conversation for the business or the person. Can you walk us through that? Because I just see so many catalysts, myself included, really struggle with that line. I think there's a lot of root efficient prioritization of of whatever resources you have is something we all have to do that might mean 
oftentimes, like time is my favorite one of those because it's the one thing that we all never get back, right? And so how you spend your time and how your team spends their time is this really, you know, you, you can expand the concept to whether it's resourcing of thing, you know, whether you're buying inventory, if you're a retailer or whether you're, um, you know, resourcing your team and figuring out how many team members to have and what the right balance of profitability to costs is, right? Like you can kind of expand it. So I'll just start with like time. But when we're thinking about how do we spend our time, one of the things that like I really realized is in order for us to get the best out of all the people we work with, we have to understand that they're so different. Some of the engineering leaders I work with are deeply, deeply introverted and are so thoughtful, but they communicate wickedly efficiently in writing. And so what I realized very quickly was instead of pulling them into a meeting with all of my revenue leaders who are talking like this, maybe I should write an executive summary that gives them, that answers all of the questions that after being in emails with them, many meetings with them for a long time, I know they are going to ask me, what is this about? What is the opportunity? How much money will it make? Who needs to be involved? What are the dependencies? What are the costs? When can we get this done by? Who, what, where, when, how about any initiative, whether we're going to run a campaign, whether we want to build a feature that's going to take resources from them and who needs to be involved and what is our upside and then downside for participating in this? Because there's always a trade-off. If you're saying I'm going to reallocate time or I'm going to reallocate resources or I'm going to reallocate engineering work or go to market, you're always doing something instead of something else. And you need to write, everything's a business case away. But the issue is business people often we do business cases like this and in verbally we're like, oh, I got an idea. And it's like going too quick. And it's sometimes not as thoughtful as it needs to be. So I just implemented a rule that says, team, we're writing executive summaries. It gets us all on the same page. We send it out, everyone reviews it and you get a request for commentary. It's something I learned from engineering uh, counterparts when I was working agency life is they write it all down. They communicate about it asynchronously over Slack. They get all their ideas on a paper. And then if you haven't already solved 90% of the ideas, you can come to a meeting and do that thing where you like come together and say, okay, we agree to disagree or yeah, we're all aligned or not. And that's an, just an example of like, how do we allocate time? You have to build that consensus. And so finding ways to build consensus instead of just bulldozing through because you're the louder voice or you are more outgoing or you are articulate, it doesn't that doesn't build followership right? It doesn't get people on your team. It doesn't make sure that they know you've thought through the challenges or invited them to help you think through things you are definitely not thinking about because you don't have their view. So I, or, or their expertise in many cases, right? So I think part of it is just understanding that people are going to people and they're all different. And so we, we, as so how to bring this back to Catalyst, Shannon, I think is Catalysts are a unique breed. They go quickly. Oftentimes they're super communicative. They're empathetic. They understand, ooh, that's a problem. And, and so they look like they're running too fast a lot of the time. And I think what they need to do is understand that there are more required checklists in their running too fast list. If I put my work on making sure that in this meeting, I want to hear what that head of engineering thinks about this. And I'm not letting go until I figure out. Sometimes that means create space. What do you think about that problem, right? Say their name, invite them. How much, like what needs to be true for that to be the case, right? Like just the asking questions instead of making assumptions. These are all like, I would say hard won <laughs> things that I've like struggled with my whole career when it comes to bringing people along. But I think once we practice those, you know, the trust gets better, the relationships get better and the initiatives go much faster because there are a necessary set of conditions to make a thing happen where everyone is aligned. And so as efficient as you can be to make sure everyone gets that alignment, even if they're not getting there the way that you would, is actually the more efficient way. It's interesting what I hear, <clears throat> what I hear in there is <clears throat> the, and, and this might not take you a lot of time. This might be a fairly intuitive thing, <clears throat> but it sounds like you see the, the value, um, value is like really business focused, but like you see the essence of the person in front of you. And you understand that maximizing again business, but it's it's there's a benefit to those people too. So it's like a, a bi-directional maximization, right? That by maximizing those people for the system that you have deeply understood, all all boats rise, and it also gives you the opportunity from a a, a little bit of an emotional distance distance because you are bringing in the business case to say, this isn't the right decision right now too. And it's, I, I've never, I don't think Tracy in any of the conversations I've heard anyone talk about, like it, there's a little bit of a puppet master in there in the, in the most benevolent way of, 
making sure that everyone in the system is feeling fully maximized and engaged and supported and heard. And that's what gets you to that next level. Well, and I'm not, I would definitely say I'm not good at this. I think this is the thing that like, I would say I'm not um, consciously, uh, like unconsciously competent at it. We all just want to be able to magically not think about it and be super relatable. I am consciously incompetent at it trying to become consciously competent at it, right? Where it's like, okay, in this meeting, like I'm writing myself notes. In this meeting, I need to make sure I get this person, this person, and this person's input because I haven't gotten it yet. And I know that I need it in order for all of us to feel good about what we need to do next, right? So it's, um, I wouldn't say people are just magically good at this thing. Like, it's like learning how to sing. Nobody comes out of the womb knowing how to sing a high C, right? Like you, st but, but when you hear an opera singer sing, you're like, oh, that just sounds so easy. And it's like, nah, they trained really hard for many, many years to learn how to do that thing. And so- I think it might not be natural to all of us, but I am 100% confident all of us can learn how. And so, you know, maybe I'm not good at it, but I, I aspire to be. I think it's the intentionality. And like people come back and take our classes like time and time again, because if we don't have some of those, the scaffolding, because being a catalyst is an innate way of being, we are likely to default to that that fast way of being. And I just like the fight going back to the singing, what, you know, I think a lesson for catalysts that I would love to extract to this is like, look, if someone starts off as a, as a baritone and it's not serving the group and they need to move into being a tenor, like that, no harm, no foul. If that's where that person and the collective are gonna thrive, it doesn't have to be like an angsty decision. It's just like, you're looking at the whole system and setting everyone up for success, so. I love this analogy the best because Physically, baritones can't become tenors. It's like a limitation of their vocal fold, right? Sometimes you can sing a different part, but like it's a perfect analogy because sometimes the capacity of the person might not be what the fit is for the team, but that's not that's right. the person, right? So that's like right. people want to be on high performance teams and they want to know what their role is within that high performance team. It's why you see, it's why I was willing to, you know, leave a higher title to come to a different level. And sometimes people change what levels they're at within different organizations in order to be able to participate in a vision and, hey, I can see how my contributions would really drive the vision that I see there, right? Culture, vision, mission, your role in that. I love the idea of like an opera, you can't put an op on an opera with one person. You can't put on, it's, it's sports and you know, put, put play, you can't, you can't be the winning championship sports team with only one player, right? Like it's that same analogy. High performance teams, which is what we're all trying to create, they require the same thing, trust in your teammates or your counterparts on stage with you or whatever, in your, you know, knowing that someone's going to show up and respect you on a phone call, be respectful of your time and of your diligent practice and discipline in order to do your craft, whatever the thing is, whether it's sports or art or business, and making sure that you like do that in a way where you know what their role is and they know what your role is. And that trade is both trusting and fair. The worst ever is when you have a bunch of high performers and somebody on the team who's not really pulling their weight, it demotivates everybody, right? And so the best thing is actually to have people in roles they're good at, right? And yeah. so oftentimes I think that's one of the, one of the challenge, you know, when we're, when you money ball teams and figure out like, Ooh, you know, maybe this person is having a baby and they want to take a different kind of like, they want to, I have, I have an amazing person on my team now, his name's Aaron. He came and was on my team before and he, his wife was going to have a baby. And he said, you know what? I need something a little bit more. I, I want to leave this more strategic partnerships role and go to something that's a little bit more transactional where I can, you know, I've been a salesperson before. I know I can make good numbers and maybe not have as much mental load on this more, you know, I need something a little more transactional and a little less strategic for a minute while I'm kind of doing this family thing. And guess what? He's right back on my team, leading the sales team in Europe now, because he, because he kind of left, you know, he was out of that phase of his life and into another one. And we just have to make sure that that's fine, right? Like if all of a sudden you think this person is great in this role, but it's not serving them, if it's not serving them, it's definitely not going to serve you. And right. so finding ways to make it pot, like if you look at anything as like one screenshot in time, it's not very, it doesn't work very well. Like people are, people have arcs, right? We have yeah. families, we have children and, and parents and, you know, we struggle, they struggle. We need to be able to make sure that our whole humans can be like brought to the table and, and done, you know, and that, that gets tricky, right? But like we, we need, you know, we need to be responsible to each other that way. So I think making sure that we can n observe in ourselves, but also in our team members, what, what we all need to be able to be our whole humans. And whether it's that ikigai idea of like what I'm contributing, what I'm good at, what I love, what the company needs, and it sits in the middle. I think making sure that we're all figuring out how to do that is really important. And I think that's why leadership coaching is so important is because it's often hard to know ourselves. So how can we possibly articulate that to our business? So that's one of the areas I think you guys do a lot of good in helping us.
I love that you brought it back to coaching. Sorry, Tracy, I have to jump in one more time there because I was going to bring that back too, because this is the other balance. You were like, we need to invest in our people, right? And like, this is like, if people are interested in growth and yet not all people are going to grow into success in their role. I'm just wondering if you have any advice, like this is what I really struggled with. It's like, I want to set everyone up for success. I want to give them umpteen chances, but at some point to your point, if they're not the high performer on the high performer team, you're doing more people a disservice. Do you have any clarity about when to make that call? I think, you know, like any company setting objectives and key results for what that person's role is, is how you make them a high performer. I think it's really easy with salespeople because they have a number on their head to say, ah, oh, that's my high performer on my team, right? I think there are so many objectives, cultural leadership, ambassadorship of your company's culture, right? Like um, I've got an amazing woman on our team who's just a huge advocate in the Latin community. And she's doing, I think, God's work or whatever, right? She's doing she's doing the amazing work to evangelize. No, you people who look like me can do roles like this. And here we are. And she's she's a leader. And she's this like, and I think she's just killing it. Now, like, is she the most senior person at the organization? No, but she's an amazing leader. And so leadership is not, it's not a vertical structure. Like it, I I think I have. You know, a guy on my team called Greg, who's like one of the most amazing cultural leaders I've ever seen. He's been with, you know, he's worked with worked with me for the past five years. I have I have examples of strategic industry leadership. A guy on my team called Matt. We've worked together now at three different companies, and nobody knows the industry like he does. He can just see, you know, all the tectonic plates shift and knows how to predict where to step based on all of that and which partners are going to succeed in that. So I think I think. I challenge not your concept, but I challenge the general concept of leadership is based on seniority. That's just like so. I think we all know that as a as a fact. Like that's just not what leadership is. There are people who we want to be around at work, no matter what role they're in, and knowing and and setting up the structures within our companies to recognize people for their leadership in their capacity in their role. That's right. I think is critical. Right. And so whether that's cultural, like. You know, this person knows people so well. They're a cultural ambassador. They're, you know, give, giving them ownership of, right. of a series, a podcast, a newsletter, uh, you know, a customer advisory board, uh, you know, a, a partnership event, you know, finding ways to make the objectives and the key results to say, this is what winning looks like. You, you look, you are what winning looks and feels like today. And making sure that that's like a system that you can implement, I think is one of the biggest areas of investment particularly in a digital world, because we used to do it so well in, in person, right? Because as humans, we say, I see you. I see what you're doing there. You're awesome. Thank you for doing that. It's really hard to do that digitally when everything feels so transactional, when you have to schedule a 15 minute call to say, you know what? I think you're great. Like it feels kind of <laughs> empty, even though we all want it. We all need those. So yeah. find, challenging our own concepts of in this very digital and remote world, how can we make sure that that regular cadence of bennies or high fives or the bonusly points or whatever it is the the recognition of you beating your targets um i call it a like a smile file when my team does something awesome you know that hype chain on slack is like go get it everybody cheer right because it's really hard to to get that digitally so i think we need to invest in that more as remote as remote uh you know members of the globe <laughs> 100%. Just hearing from these things, I'm guessing that you could uh, give a whole talk on how to manage Gen Z too. Like I just pull it like you're really good at understanding some of the ways of empowering folks that aren't necessarily about the change. Just for the next for the next conversation, Sharon. For the next conversation, yeah, I'll, I'll do some thinking on that. <laughs> I'd love to step back. You mentioned when we were you were talking about your challenges and building trust, like building trust with other catalysts. And so, would love to understand in your career what has been the role of or value in being able to find your fellow catalysts and be able to you know connect with them about insights and challenges. Uh I mean, you can't do it alone, right? The value of it is, is, is anything you're trying to do will not happen alone, period. Um, you want to be known as the person you want on, uh, the other person wants on your team, not the person they want on the opposite team. You know, it's, uh, board games are a really nice analogy because sometimes it's really fun to gang up on the person who's strong and has a strong opinion because you don't want the, you know what I mean? Like you see it in board games a lot. Yeah. You have the, I, you know, the instigator and then you have the opposition and then in these groups of four, you have the person who says, I don't really care. And then the person who votes on the opposition or the instigator, and they're the one with the power, actually, right? And any in any in deciding what direction something will go, it's the voice of the voter who says, I like your this in, in this idea versus that one. I vote for that one. 
that person is the catalyst that you need to bring along with you because nobody you there campaigns are not yucky running a campaign is i've got an idea and i want to bring you on to my side of seeing this because i don't believe you yet have the same information i do because if you did you would make the same conclusion i am making that's what any campaign is right and the importance of that is if you don't do it effectively trustingly with, with like doing it in a way where you're building trust where people can believe the thing you're saying like there's a reason political campaigns have smear campaigns it's so that you don't trust what they say mm -hmm. right like we have to build trust and then work with the people in order to bring them along with us and hopefully improve the ideas as they go because ideas at first instance like ideas are never done right systems are never done rollouts are never done they're only they're only a screenshot in time of where they are in their arc of like success or not yeah. and and so i think making sure that you have the staying power for making sure that ideas can live beyond just the idea the execution the go to market the ongoing support the advocacy the go to the, all of the pieces that are the measurement and ongoing measurement and then optimization because the machines need to evolve over time i think right. all of those things are critical and if you don't have a catalyst at every single one of those life cycle journey points of your idea you'll fail that's so beautifully said and i i i this, I'm going to have to go back and listen to everything here because there's like a zillion uh, metaphors that you're bringing forward. And I just, I, like, I want to I want to incorporate them all. And Shannon and I, in our class, we talk about influence and some of the steps to creating influence. And one of the things we talk about is, is needing to go in assuming allyship. Yeah. And I just loved how you talked about that I'm going to assume you'd make the same decision I am if we all had the same information, right? That's such a gentle and yet optimistic perspective. Um, like, yeah, we might be in opposite places right now. It's just because we haven't had the chance to really talk it out and share information. Well, just, and I might change my view, right? right? I'm to a, like, I only know what I know, right? I'm yeah. going to come to the table. And if I don't ask you questions about things, I think giving yourself the freedom to have your strong opinions, but loosely held is really important because if somebody comes to you with information that you didn't have, you need to not die on that hill. You need to say, right. oh my God, the data you're presenting to me Maybe we should look at it differently. You're totally right. Oh my gosh, what if like what if it was okay if we all just said we were wrong and that and then we changed? Like, let's give ourselves the freedom to be wrong and say, ah, my perspective was this. But until you showed me that, and then I really I learned, you know, when somebody said, Ooh, it sounds like you're flip-flopping your point of view, I said, Oh, congratulations, you flip-flopped my point of view. You were so effective in your communication. I need to merchandise that to you better so that you don't look like you're inconsistent. You need to look like you're willing to have your mind be changed, right? Like that growth mindset applies to everybody at all levels. And if somebody comes to me with a channel that is the delivering a better cost of acquisition for the same output, you better believe we should put money there instead. You know what I mean? So like, I think, I think what we all know is here are my decisions or my proposals based on the information I have. Please tell me more information I need or help me understand what you need in order to see the information I have and make sure you understand it so we can get to the same conclusion. It seems pretty like obvious, but it's like really not. Like sometimes really executives don't even have like the same meetings where you have a head of technology and a head of product and a head of go-to-market and sales all in the same room, even talking. Like you gotta start with the cadence. Like who are the people whose opinions you actually need? If you're building a dashboard and you don't have your business stakeholder and the person who builds the who sources the data for you and the person who builds the report all in the same room boy things are going to get weird for you really quick totally all right uh now you can see total total girl crush she's amazing last question the fun one who is your favorite catalyst past or present and why reese witherspoon reese witherspoon who got up there and created and sold a production company for near a billion dollars who said stories for women by women matter and it will and it will make business sense to tell these stories absolutely if i could go work for her tomorrow are you listening race if you, i'm just, i'm she's my hero right like i think beautiful blonde that everybody miss uh underestimated genius who could tell stories, no matter what stories they were, whether they were hers when she was the mouthpiece as the actress or whether she became this super extremely legitimate executive producer and then runner of, you know, her production company that she then sold. Like she's the, she's the goal, right? She's also a mother. She's also a partner. She's also an amazing daughter, like all the things, right? Like she's like, I, I, and there's so few of them. 
I mean, we were doing this conversation. You're like, okay, you know who the tech leader is. You know who the business leader is. You know who the finance leader is. And they're all men of these big, big, big companies. And I love men because they have they have given me the opportunities in my life that I needed. But I think the fact that we don't have very ma many women holding up that I sold this company, you know, like for me, it's like, it's Reese Witherspoon, it's Taylor Swift, it's Beyonce, it's Kerry Washington. Like, and it sucks that they all come out of this kind of, essentially entertainment industry. Like, I think that, that means we need to look at ourselves a little bit and understand what that means. We think the role of women in society is and their ability to contribute, but I'm glad to say, I think it's changing. Amazing, especially with badass leaders like yourself. So that, thanks for having me. You guys are awesome. Likewise, it was so fun having you, Sharon. All right, to our listeners, if you'd like to learn more about how to create big, bold, positive change in the world, make sure to check out our book, Move Fast, Break Shit, Burn Out, or go to our website at catalystconstellations.com. And if you enjoyed this episode, like I know Shannon and I did, please take 10 seconds to rate it on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your, to your podcasts. If you have other catalysts in your life, hit the share button and send a link their way.